welcome everybody. It is a, a beautiful sunny day here in uh, south of Boston, Massachusetts. I have a special guest with me. His name is Tyler Foley. And for those that don't know Tyler, he is the founder of a company called Total Buy-In. He's a keynote speaker, trainer, and author of a book called The Power to Speak Naked. And today he's here uh, with me to talk about how to be an effective public speaker. So Tyler, thank you for being here. I apologize for screwing up our schedule. We are limited on time, but we're going to get a lot covered today. Thank you. Oh, and it's my joy and my pleasure. And I promise to pack as much as I can into the next half hour to 45 minutes so that we can serve your audience to the best of its ability. You're the best and patient, and I appreciate it. So I'm going to do a quick synopsis of what I know about you. I've watched some of your YouTube videos. I have read a little bit about you. So here's what I know. I know you started off as a child actor. I know you've got a little bit of uh, experience as a stuntman. I know you suffered a stroke uh, as, a, as a younger person. Uh, I know you uh, founded a company in the safety uh, space and then got into training and then training in the safety space. And then ultimately you are a trainer for public speakers. That's what I know. What did I miss? How did you get here and uh, get us get us started? Well, no, you did a good job of, of doing the summary. So let's uh, fill in the gray areas and, and we'll go from there. So yes, a uh, uh, child actor. I started on stage when I was six years old, I moved into film and television in my late teens, was lucky enough to get to dabble in stunts. I'm a, an actor who has done stunt work as opposed to a stunt performer who has done some acting. Um, and that was, it was a joy. I've worked with great stunt professionals. Uh, my buddy, Nick Barrick, um, who I trained with for a couple of years, you actually see him in the first Deadpool movie. He's one of the henchmen. Um, when Deadpool is at the beginning, he's messing up an SUV on a freeway, which is filmed in Vancouver. And, and you see my buddy, Nick, he's kind of doing a slow-mo fly through the air, which is always fun every time I see it. Cause typically you don't get to see stuntmen like that's, that's one of the things with the gig, the really good stunt guys are always doubling. And so you never see their faces. So every once in a while, I get to see some of these guys, Lars and Nick and Rick, and I get to be like, Oh, Hey, look, I, did, I, I know that guy. And that's, that's more fun for me than when I see myself on film and television. Cause I'm like, Oh, that was, that was brutal. That was bad. I would, I wouldn't do that again fully. <laughs> so I got to do a little bit of stunts. And the nice thing about stunts was that I got to learn a lot about safety systems. So later in life, um, I was when I was putting together uh, a business, as you'd said, I, I got into the safety space. I, it was a real easy transition for me because I was able to go, oh, well, when I did stunts, I did this. And I found myself saying that so much that some executives actually heard me one day yelling at some guys <laughs> because they were... I can't remember where they were. They were either up on a scissor lift or a ladder, but we had some large executives coming through for uh, um, uh, completions uh, check on a building. And, uh, and they just weren't, they weren't working safe. And I, I went off on this rant about how I used to jump out of six story windows and made it out okay. And that what I did, I felt more safer jumping out of a six story window than watching these guys stand up on the ladder doing what they were doing. And the executive actually heard me go off on this rant. He said, that was a really good message. Would you mind saying it again? And then I ended up doing it. And one of the other executives said, hey, would you come and give that as a keynote presentation at our uh, safety stand down? And I went, sure. What's a keynote? <laughs> so I had to figure out what keynote presentations were. And then when I realized that you, I could have more impact speaking from stage to multiple people telling my story and then I could one-on-one -on -one, um, you know and really actually make a difference doing this this public speaking thing I pivoted back and and now I just consider it a, a, a further evolution of my job as a performer right and then I had a whole bunch of people come to me and say well how do you do that thing that you do and I said well oh, well it's simple you just do blah 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 and they'd be like no it's not that simple you don't understand I'm like, no, you don't understand. It is actually just that simple. And then I started training people on how to take the stage with confidence, uh, how to show up, how to tell a powerful story and how to connect with your audience. And next thing I knew, I've, I've got an entire new business yep. training people on public speaking. And it's, it's very easily beyond my role and job as a father. It's the most rewarding career I've ever had. 
right? I would think incredibly empowering when you, when you have confidence enough in yourself to stand in front of an audience and believe that you have something to offer. So tell me a little bit about the types of people or the types of organizations that come to you. There, I'm sure there are people like me that train people for a living, but I would think plenty of executives and, and, and business professionals that need to present, whether it's to their clients, to their employees, to an association, they're all viable uh, clients for you, I would think, right? Oh, yeah. And, and a lot tend to be. I actually have two very distinct avatars within my business. The one is exactly as you suggested, CEO, um, C-suites anyway. So whether that's a COO, CEO, CFO, people who are typically having to give presentations and are tired of giving dry presentations or don't think that they can be, you know, Steve Jobs, boom, yep. right? Yep. They want um, they want to have impact, but just don't know how to package that messaging or are not comfortable speaking publicly and recognize that it is part of their role or their function. And then I have the junior executives who would like to have more impact, would like to get those promotions and public speaking is the thing that's hindering them. And so that's, that's the one kind of group. And then uh, surprisingly, uh, the other avatar that I typically work with, the, my, um, my main clientele right now are not necessarily business CEOs, but charity directors. So still a CEO, but in a non-for-profit area and yep. space. And a lot of those charity directors um, have incredible uh, passion for what they do and amazing stories behind why they do what they do. But a lot of them, um, I, I find it's a, a quirk of the space and that a lot of them don't like or are uncomfortable taking the spotlight mm. and feel that it takes away from the work. And what they don't understand is that by standing up on stage and, and sharing their message, that's actually how they have more impact and can do more work for what they do. So I have found in the last year and a half that I've been working more and more and more with uh, directors of charities and helping them position their messaging so that they can have more impact with the social causes that they promote. And that, that has been incredibly rewarding for me. Because as you said, it's one thing to stand up and be like, hey, I've got this message. It's another thing to be able to watch somebody else a blossom into being able to tell that message and have more impact than I could have as a single individual. Right. And there's so much you talk about, um, you know, again, in your videos, but I also like in, in the book, I know you talk about in the videos, but also in the book, I love what you say about the word authenticity, which drives me up a wall, to be honest with you, man. I hate the word. So <laughs> it's a swear word in my head. I house. hate it. I hate I it. I do too. Okay, so so just just give me some perspective, give everyone some perspective on key things that anybody that gets in front of an audience should be considering, that being one of them. Just expand on it. I don't want to steal your thunder here. Yeah, no. So for me, I, I, I same as you, I, I can't stand the word authentic. I think it's overused and misunderstood. For me, authenticity is synonymous with self-awareness, right? I can get up on stage and I mean, if you in real life, and you can ask my wife, I have a bit of a temper and a lot of a trucker mouth. So if I got up on stage and went on a rant and swore my face off, technically that's authentically me, mm -hmm. but I don't think that is authentic. That's not me being authentic. And yet so many people will do, oh, if they don't like it, that's that. I mean, that's who I am. That's just who I am. That's me being authentic. If they don't like it, I'm being authentic. No, 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 no authenticity is synonymous with self-awareness. I can be here calm with grace and a PG mouth and still give you authentic Tyler Foley because I am aware of who I am at my core and I don't deviate from my core values, and my core standards. I know what I align with and I stay in that alignment. And that is really what authenticity means. It doesn't mean that it gives you free reign to be a jackass if you like to swear. That's, that's not authenticity. It doesn't give you the right to just insult people or say whatever comes out of your mouth. You still have to be structured with your message. Yep. So for me, authenticity is synonymous with self-awareness and you can't present um, who you are if you don't know who you are. Right. Or and you don't accept it. 
or you don't accept it. That's the other thing too. The, an audience, we know, we know we have an innate BS meter. And I know when you're lying. Even if you don't know that you're lying, I know that you're lying. I know that you're trying to come across as somebody that you're not. I know. And I know when you come across as somebody that you are, that's the thing. Like when people open up, like we as an audience feel it. And I, I would rather highlight the positive than harp on the negative because it's such an exciting and joyful thing when you see somebody actually get raw and vulnerable yeah. when they get real that's when we connect with people we go oh yes oh that makes so much sense right and and that's really with the other point to the you know why i don't like the swear word of authenticity um but where the power of story comes in right when we know who we are when we are when we are aware of of who we are at our core and who we are not and we can get into alignment into that energy that's when we can tell our stories in a powerful way because we stop worrying about what the audience thinks yep and we start worrying about how we can serve the audience with our message right and and, and that's when you're message will resonate with the audience that needs to hear it we can't please everybody so stop trying right and that's the other thing problem with when people oh i'm an authentic speaker you know blah, blah, blah. no just be you and you will find your audience it will your messaging will resonate with the people that need to hear it and right. i think that's that's the key to a really good successful keynote obviously your experience as an actor has served you in many ways and, and, and to some extent, giving, giving you an advantage, uh, uh, you know, when, when you compare yourself to those that have never even stood in front of a, you know, a, you know, a room full of like three people, you know, and, 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 and have the, how do you take somebody who is uncomfortable walking into a stranger's home uh, and get them to a place where they're, they're comfortable standing in front of a room full of, you know, maybe a hundred people, a thousand people? Well, so the first thing is, People will claim to be afraid of public speaking, and it's a falsehood and a, narr a, a narrative that we create in our heads that I like to eliminate quickly. Yeah. And the quickest way that I do it, I'm sure you've heard me say it before, is anybody who can go to a restaurant. I want your audience to think about it right now. When was the last time you were in a restaurant? And I recognize we're coming out of a weird time in history. So that may have been 18 months ago. It may have been last week. It could have been last night. I don't know when the last time you were at a restaurant was. But if you think about when the last time you were at a restaurant was, did you order food? Because if you were able to order food, you used your mouth to speak the thing that you wanted to a complete stranger, likely, unless you knew your wait staff ahead of time. Right. So you spoke to a stranger in public with your mouth asking for something that you wanted and you received it. So instantaneously this myth that I'm afraid to speak in public, I'm afraid to speak to strangers, and I'm afraid to ask for what I want is blown out completely if you've ever been to a restaurant and ordered food. Yeah. And so that's the first thing that I want people to see is the ridiculousness of the statement that I am afraid of public speaking. Yeah. You're not. You're afraid of public judgment. Right. And so now we have to overcome why. Where did that fear start? Yep. And let's erase it. Because for me, I had the luxury of being on stage and in front of an audience before I knew that that was a thing, before I was conditioned by societal norms to know that that's a thing that I'm supposed to fear. It was in fact a thing that I took great joy and great pride and great pleasure in yep. because nothing feels better than making an audience laugh yep. or the, the sound of applause or even better, if you can get a standing ovation, yep. there is a magnetism, there is a power that rolls through a room. Oh, and yeah. when you felt that, you want it again. Oh, yeah. And so usually when I'm working with uh, my clients, it's one of the first things that I do is I get them to have a standing ovation. Like, you know, we, I, when I'm doing my workshops, I do, you know, full facilitations. I make sure, especially with my one-on-one -on -one private clients, if you're going to pay me the big bucks yep. and it's, a, you know, mid five figures to work with me one-on-one -on -one for a year. Mm -hmm. You're getting, you're getting a deep dive into psychology. You're getting a deep dive into performance. You're getting a deep dive into everything that I've known over 35 years, and including the fact that one of the first times we meet, we're going to meet, and then you're going to be up on stage. Right. right. <laughs> because I, I believe in rapid immersion. I believe that if you want to get something out of the way, 
if you want to overcome a fear, you have to jump. If you're afraid of sharks, you got to get into a shark cage and swim in the water. Like right. that's just how it is. You're still terrified, but then you realize that it wasn't as bad as you thought. Right. And so one of the first things that I do is I get people up on stage. And when you feel the power of a standing ovation and you recognize what that can be, now I can start to tackle, look, that is, that's a great thing. So let's strive towards this. Let's tackle where was it that you first began to fear judgment? Yep. And a lot of times it's not actually in a public speaking forum. People will may have had a, a negative experience, uh, you know, stage fright, which is a real thing, by the way. Yeah. Fear of public speaking, not a real thing. Stage fright, very real thing. Yep. And so let's tackle where some of this stuff happened. Let's get into the psychology of where uh, these fears have manifested themselves. And then let's uh, let's tackle them head on so that they're not an issue. Yeah, well, you, you talked about there was a one 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 uh, snippet I watched and you talked about being proud of yourself and a lot of people struggle their whole lives and never get to that point. Thing, things that I they come to mind with myself over the years, there was a time where my whole face was covered and covered in acne or my or my pants were like two inches too short and I knew it. Um, you know, you've got other people, I was really skinny. You've got other people that are uncomfortable with their weight or their height or their hair. I mean, you name it. How often are you dealing with a physical, you know, uh, fear or, or, or is it pr primarily the, just purely a fear of judgment that I'm not smart enough or I'm too heavy? I mean, what is it? It's, it's all of those things. I mean, yeah. sometimes it's a, 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 you know, a physical look, but again, it doesn't matter what the physicality of a person is it's always a mental game, yeah. right? Because you can see people who are maybe carrying an extra hundred pounds that they could um, lose to release, yeah. but they're wickedly confident. Yeah. Or maybe they don't even want to release it because it's who they are and they love being that way. And then that, that's great, yeah. you know? And it maybe you know, somebody like you or me, right? I'm to this day, frustratingly skinny. Now I'm, you know, five foot seven, 135 pounds, right? Like I am a wee tiny man. And it always surprises people when they find that out too, because I am a very big personality. I make up for it with just this jubilation and explosion of, of uh, smiles and energy. So yeah. the, you know, I, there's so many ways to, to compensate it, but it's, it's recognizing that 90% of it is a mental game, you know? I, I could pick apart the things that I don't like about myself. Even you mentioned, I had a medical incident when I was 17. It paralyzed the left side of my face. It paralyzed the left side of my body. Yep. At 17, I'm going to a fine arts high school. I want to go to New York or Broadway or LA and be an actor, name and lights. I'm going to be a movie star. I'm going to be a stage sensation. I'm going to... I'm going to get the EGOTs. I'm going to get my Emmy, my Golden Globe, my Oscar, my Tony. I'm going to be the GOAT, greatest of all time. And then my face stops working. Yeah. You know, and, and that, that was a very humbling experience for me to realize that I am not the greatest. Yeah. Um, and now I have a little bit of challenge to overcome. And, and when you have those moments, you ask yourself, well, is this worth it? And for me, it was, I'm like, no, I'm, I'm going to make all of this work again. Yep. And a year of very, very intense therapy, physiotherapy, you know, every kind of Eastern and Western medicine that I could get my hands on. I became a, a student of neuropathy to try and figure out how to make my body work again. Right. Um, and, and, you know, I had great um, guidance and tutelage and coaching from some incredible people in my life that uh, helped me through that. But that's, that's part of the challenge, right? Is recognizing that most of our adversity comes from our own internal struggle, our own mindset. Right. And when we can overcome that, then anything really becomes possible. And, and all you have to do is look, you, you know, you have people, everybody has had circumstances that have happened in their lives. And I look at, um, you know, some of the uh, children of thalidomide, right? We, there are some famous, famous motivational speakers who with almost no appendages, small little nubs that can kind of work together, play the drums. Yeah. Now, I've been drumming since I was 12 years old on a full kit. 
And I see some of these oh, yeah. <laughs> speakers who don't have as many limbs as I have yeah. with way better technique than I do. Yep. Yeah. You know, so there's, and there's the people who are like, well, I can't do a thing. Look, I, I've got no arms. You go, okay, well, yeah. Call them A and call them B. It all comes down to mindset. There's people who uh, overcome adversity and there's people who succumb to adversity and you have to choose which one you're going to be. No, I think that's the core. I think what, what, what you just said is the core. There's, there's multiple things running through my head as you're talking. I've seen wrestlers with no limbs wrestle. You know, uh, you look at a lot of, I, I notice on television, if I watch, say, a news broadcast, many of the people on TV have speech impediments, but yet they're on TV speaking. The average person probably doesn't pick up on the lisp or the whatever that is, but they're there. Um, but the other, the two things that come to mind, two people that come to mind as you're talking that are comedians um, with very, very different styles. One, I believe, is pure unabashed realness and the other is very rehearsed. It's not that it's not real, but it's very measured and uh, rehearsed. One is Will Ferrell. He'll walk around mm -hmm. in his underwear. He doesn't care what he looks like, how he feels, what he, all that, it, just just pure. I'm like, that's that to me is, is beautiful. And then you take somebody else who I also like, Jerry Seinfeld, he scripts all the way down to the specific word choices in his act and it needs to be a certain way. How would you compare yourself to either of those guys? I know you're not a comedian. Where would you gravitate? Which style? I'd be on the side of Will Ferrell because I have no problem taking off my clothes and I <laughs> script nothing. Um, and I, I, I love what uh, Seinfeld does. And I, I'm mostly appreciative of Jerry Seinfeld for coming up with the greatest joke ever around public speaking, where he points out that, you know, the, in the order of fears, the number one fear, for all people is actually not public speaking. It's the fear of falling, fear of heights. That's the number one fear universally amongst uh, humanity, which makes sense because that's the thing that's going to kill us. Then the next fear is public speaking, followed by the fear of death. So public speaking is above fear of death. And Jerry Seinfeld famously said, that means you'd rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. And so <laughs> now I have the greatest ability to quote Jerry Seinfeld every time I'm talking about the fear of public speaking. And so, uh, and the funny thing is, apparently there is a story behind that, that Jerry Seinfeld actually didn't write that joke. Oh, really? They were at the, one of the big comedy, well, big, it's a small club where Jerry tends to rehearse his stuff before he goes and does the big ones. And it was another comedian. And I can't remember which one, uh, one of the guys who usually does a lot of the roasts, I think, and I can't, right. but I, again, I can't remember which comedian it was, but he, they were talking about it backstage and he had said he'd done the joke and Jerry was like, well, that's pretty good. And he was like, yeah, you can have it. Right. Yeah. You just, and now it's one of Seinfeld's most famous, most quoted jokes. And he's like, no, oh, that was mine. It was mine. Right. Oh man. I did not know that story. That's a good story. Hey, uh, there's something I want you to comment on. And I know I, I I'll let you kind of wrap up in whatever way you want to wrap up. But before we get to that point, you know, what's interesting to me is how you didn't, from what I can tell, you did not set out initially to do this work. It kind of, you kind of found it not through happenstance, but when you really think about it, your experience on stage your experience in the safety space of all of all things, the, 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 even if you did a little bit of stunt work, somehow led you to this place where you fail like you can and, and do you teach people how to get up on stage and speak effectively. How did you start to pay attention to how did you let go of acting or let go of the safety space enough so that you could create this when did you recognize that maybe maybe I should be pursuing this a lot of people never realize those things. Um, I did a talk called uh, Your River, Your Dreams, where I talked about energy and uh, feeling the flow of energy. Like there, we all have signposts along the way. And when you're, as uh, Tony Robbins calls it in state, um, some people call it in flow. Yep. Um, if you uh, study a lot of Eastern philosophies, you know, your Zen, yep. when you are at peace with the world, there is an energy that flows around you. And if you attune yourself to that, it becomes very apparent what you're supposed to do. Because when you try to do something else, you get slapped in the face. Yep. Yep. <laughs> you know, and I, when I did my talk, I was talking about it's, it's like a river course where 
I can take a boat or just my body, I could swim. And if I try to swim upstream against the current, I'm going to exhaust a lot of energy and move very little. Can I get upstream if I paddle a boat? Absolutely. But will it take me five times as long to travel the same distance as if I just let the oar go, yep. put my hands behind my head and let the boat kick back along the current? Yep. And it's taking the time to recognize what are those signs? It, are you, is the energy propelling you forward or are you pushing against the momentum that's being presented to you? And so one of the funny things is, is I actually haven't let go of the safety and I haven't let go of the acting because they are a part of what has led me on this journey and this path. They're still there. I just do them significantly less, mm -hmm. right? Acting is a hobby now. It's just fun because I've been doing it for 35 years. So it's still a hobby that pays. Yep. <laughs> you yep. know, I'm a unionized actor. I'm actress ag. Uh, I can do whatever, right? Sure. I, I'm, I'm there. I'm going to show up. I'm going to be on film if they ask me. But I'm, it's not, um, I don't need to get the audition now. Right. Which is great because it means that I book more auditions now because, uh, you know, you don't come into a casting room reeking of desperation right like, what do you want to do you know, if i get it great if i don't whatever yeah and the safety business has been able to be structured in a way that it operates independent of me i yep. come in and i check in with my team once a quarter maybe a few times a month if i if i need to be the person who's doing the audit because i'm the only one qualified for it within the pool of auditors that we have maybe i go and do it but it's primarily structured around tyler does keynotes Yep. Right. So nobody's really booking me to audit anymore. They're booking me to come speak at their thing. I might kick off an audit yep. as part of a keynote presentation because we build that into our packages. It just makes it easier. And now my life is structured around how do I serve people best? How do I give this gift that I have? Because it's a gift. I've been, you know, everybody has their area of genius. This is mine. Mm -hmm. I get to come and speak. That's and it's really hard to make that a useful thing for society when all you're good at is being a talking head. <laughs> well, so, yeah, but, but just to, not to cut you off, but you also talk, I, I watch some of your stuff. I mean, you, you, you have your speaking and your training, but you expect people to do something with it. So it's, it's I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to even show you how to do it, but you still have to do it. You expect results. But, and that's, that's where, that's where this gift has been the most rewarding is that it, it's one thing for me to just say my messaging. But it's another thing to empower other people to say their messaging. And that's where I get the most satisfaction. And that's to wrap up what you were asking. How did I know this was the thing? It's because I don't care if I get paid to do this. I'm going to keep doing it. Right? A lot of what I do, especially with you know, promoting the book and when you're, when you're pushing a lot of the, the training and the seminars that I do, a lot of that is, is volunteer time. <laughs> Right. Because I don't get paid to come and do the media appearances, to do the podcast, to do the one hour previews. Those are all um, potential revenue generating lead opportunities. Sure. But I'm never looking at it as a, how many clients am I going to acquire, you know, showing up on Dave's show today. Right. That's, it, I, it doesn't even cross my mind. What I'm worried about is how can I serve this audience that I'm in front of right now the best that they can walk away with something. Yep. And that's where I know that I'll keep doing this for forever because safety stopped being fun at some point. Yep. Acting became a job at some point. But performance, being on stage, training people, showing other people how to be on stage and mentoring and guiding people through that, that has, I've been doing that for a long time. Like, yeah, I started acting when I was six, but by the time I was 12, I was a veteran actor. At 12. <laughs> right, right. You know, and I would guide other people in school plays or even when I got into high school and I went to a fine arts high school, I was kind of the, the person that people looked to for advice when it came to performance. Right. And so it's something that I've been doing for forever. And even in safety, my the most rewarding parts of, of safety for me was when I was doing my training and people had their light bulb moments. Yep. So again, paying attention to the flow, where am I getting the most satisfaction out of this? And how do I continue through? so that I feel 
that I have contributed to your success. Right. And so I'll do this for free. It was just paying attention to the, the mile markers along the way. And I will keep doing this for the rest of my life. Right. And it's almost like you have a secret to happiness in a lot of ways or a secret to self-esteem that you want to pass on to people. You know, if you can just get them to a point where, hey, you, you've got the same to offer. You've, you've got this opportunity and, and it's intoxicating for those that figure it out or are willing to cross that threshold. What's, yeah. uh, what's, what do you want people to know? A couple of things. What do you want people to know as a result of this conversation? What's the best way for them to get in touch with you and where, where can they find that book? Well, the first thing that I would like them to walk away from this knowing is that no matter who you are, or what you do, you have a story. Everybody has a story. And it's unfortunate because a lot of people um, try to shy away from that greatness or try to shy away from um, believing in themselves which I think is a tragedy because if you don't believe in yourself, who will, you know, I love my wife and I love watching RuPaul's drag race. And at the end of it, right. At the end of every episode, what does she say? Honey, if you can't love yourself, who the, you know, if you can't love yourself, who the hell are you, you can, right. And like, that's, that's beautiful. You got it. And it's so true. You have, you have to be the one to believe in yourself before anybody else will. And some people have a hard time. And I'd like to think of myself as somebody who can jumpstart that, right? We all know that every once in a while, your battery dies. But it doesn't mean that it can't be recharged. And if you don't believe in yourself, I want to be the person who believes in you so that you can start to feel that again, so that you can go and have an impact. And a lot of people mistake, like, you don't have to impact a million people. You don't even have to impact a thousand people. If you can go in and just be the first domino to knock over one other domino or be that first drop in the water that ripples upon, all you have to do is affect that first knock. Just help one other person. And that, that should be enough. Yep. If you can continue to replicate that over and over and over again, or you can do that with a single drop and affect multiple people, great. But all my only goal is to help one person help one other person. Yep. Yep. So I would want people to leave knowing that they do have a message, that the thing they're afraid to say is probably the thing that their audience needs to hear. And if they want help discussing that, they can always reach me at seantylerfoley.com. And Sean spelled the proper Irish way, S-E-A-N-T-Y-L-E-R-F-O-L-E-Y.com. But before they do that, Dave, I want them to go because one of the big things they need to do is cut through the noise. And so if they're listening to cut through the noise and they're regularly listening to cut through the noise and they're getting value out of what you are doing, I want them to hit pause on this recording, go give you a five-star review, say what episode impacted them the most so that people can go and find that. And if anything, that will be the ripple that they start. All right. So go find the episode. Uh, name it out, give Cut Through the Noise a five-star review, and then if you want to work on your messaging so that maybe you're the next guest that gets to come on and speak with Dave, well, then you reach out to me at seantylerfoley.com and I'll see what I can do to help you out. Excellent. I appreciate the, uh, the, the, the acknowledgement there. And where, where can they get the book? Uh, and you, Tyler, not Sean Tyler, right? Do I call you Tyler or am I screwing this up? You call me Tyler because right. we're friends. So All here's right, the good. thing. professionally. On stage, I am Sean Tyler Foley. So if I was to take a stage right now, we're like, you know, 10,000 people in an auditorium. And they're taking the stage now is Sean Tyler Foley. And you're like, ah, all right. We're backstage in the green room, you and I are hanging out, Dave. And we're like, Tyler. hey, you know, it's Tyler. Got it. Tyler. Got it. The only, if you wanted to be really proper and make my mom super happy, you'd call me Sean Tyler. Okay. But it confuses so many people because then they think your last name's Tyler, which is not. I'm a proud Foley. Right. Um, and so my mom and my sister call me Sean Tyler. But if you ask my wife who she's married to, she would say Tyler. And I would say that my wife is the default authority on who I am. So okay. <laughs> let's go with what she calls me. And I'm it's Tyler. To answer your other question, um, the book can be found at bookshop.org is where I would love people to go to. Yes, you can get it 
on um, a site owned by Jeff Bezos, but he's busy flying to space right now. Yes. And he has enough money. We don't need to give Jeff more cash. Yeah. But if people go to bookshop.org, it's the same online shopping experience. You can add a book to your cart and it doesn't have to be the power to speak naked. You could put my friend's book, Get the Hell Out of Debt, Aaron Sky Kelly. It's a fantastic book. It just came out recently. Yeah. You could pick up any book that you want on bookshop.org. But what it will do is connect you with your local book retailer, your mom and pop shop, the brick and mortar store that's probably been in your neighborhood for a couple of generations. Bookshop.org will connect you with them online so that you're supporting local businesses. So I don't care which title you do. If you want to get a, a copy of The Power to Speak Naked, you'll have to pre-order it because it's available September 7th, but I would definitely appreciate the pre-orders. Okay. Um, but it doesn't have to be my book. Any book that you want, the next time you think, oh, I should get that book, if your audience could do me the favor and go to bookshop.org because that's, that's where you have impact. And I'll let you in on a secret. You get the book cheaper there. Okay, good to know. So it costs a little bit more if you go and support Jeff than if you uh, go and support your local book retailer. So for so I many reasons, go to bookshop.org bookshop.org we will leave it at that tyler thank you so much i i appreciate your flexibility today i enjoyed the conversation me as well david thank you for having me i appreciated it